Eventful Reign of Sapor I, King of Persia, A.D. 240, by George Rawlinson. Under Mithridates I, the Parthian Empire rose to great power, and that monarch, about B.C. 163, began to make conquests toward the west. By B.C. 150, he had added to his possessions Media Magna, Susiniana, Babylonia, Assyria proper, and Persia. The Persians appear to have yielded without resistance to his rule, and he governed them with a fair degree of moderation, allowing them, as was the Parthian policy toward subject peoples, a large measure of self-government under their hereditary native kings, the king of kings exacting little from them besides regular tribute and the required number of men for his armies. The Parthian Empire was in turn overthrown by Artashir or Artaxerxes, who about BC 226 defeated and killed Artavan, the last Parthian king, and became the chief founder of the Sasanian dynasty, which ruled Persia until the Mohammedan invasion. The victories of Artaxerxes had fatal results for the Roman power in the east, for the new head of the Persian monarchy was no sooner established on his throne than he sent an embassy to the Roman emperor, Alexander Severus, to demand from him the surrender of all Asia and the withdrawal of Roman arms and authority to the western shores of the Aegean Sea and of the Propontis, as the Sea of Marmora was anciently called. From this began a series of wars which continued at intervals for four centuries, and which ended only with the Mahometan conquests that overwhelmed Roman and Persian power alike. The first campaigns of the Romans against Artaxerxes were indecisive, but the renewal of the war in the reign of his son, Sapor I, was followed by disasters to the Roman arms which Rawlinson describes in his most lucid and vigorous manner, together with the other feats of this remarkable man. Artaxerxes appears to have died in A.D. 240. He was succeeded by his son Shupuri, or Sapor, the first Sasanian prince of that name. According to the Persian historians, the mother of Sapor was a daughter of the last Parthian king, Artabanus, whom Artaxerxes had taken to wife after his conquest of her father. But the facts known of Sapor throw doubt on this story, which has too many parallels in Oriental romance to claim implicit credence. Nothing authentic has come down to us respecting Sapor during his father's lifetime, but from the moment that he mounted the throne, we find him engaged in a series of wars, which show him to have been of a most active and energetic character. Armenia, which Artaxerxes had subjected, attempted, it would seem, to regain its independence at the commencement of the reign, but Sapor easily crushed the nascent insurrection, and the Armenians made no further effort to free themselves till several years after his death. Contemporaneously with this revolt in the mountain region of the north, a danger showed itself in the plains country of the south, where Manizan, king of Hatra, or al Hader, not only declared himself independent, but assumed dominion over the entire tract between the Euphrates and the Tigris, the Jazeera of the Arabian geographers. The strength of Hatra was great, as had been proved by Trajan and Severus. Its thick walls and valiant inhabitants would probably have defied every attempt of the Persian prince to make himself master of it by force. He, therefore, resorted to stratagem. Manizan had a daughter who cherished ambitious views. On obtaining a promise from Sapor that if she gave Hatra into his power, he would make her his queen, this unnatural child turned against her father, betrayed him into Sapor's hands, and thus brought the war to an end. Sapor recovered his lost territory, but he did not fulfill his bargain. Instead of marrying the traitoress, he handed her over to an executioner to receive the death that she had deserved, though scarcely at his hands. Encouraged by his success in these two lesser contests, Sapor resolved, apparently in AD 241, to resume the bold projects of his father and engage in a great war with Rome. The confusion and troubles which afflicted the Roman Empire at this time were such as might well give him hopes of obtaining a decided advantage. Alexander, his father's adversary, had been murdered in AD 235 by Maximin, 
who from the condition of a Thracian peasant had risen into the higher ranks of the army. The upstart had ruled like the savage that he was, and after three years of misery, the whole Roman world had risen against him. Two emperors had been proclaimed in Africa. On their fall, two others had been elected by the Senate. A third, a mere boy, had been added at the demand of the Roman populace. All the pretenders except the last had met with violent deaths, and after the shocks of a year, unparalleled since A.D. 69, the administration of the greatest kingdom in the world was in the hands of a youth of fifteen. Sapor, no doubt, thought he saw in this condition of things an opportunity that he ought not to miss, and rapidly matured his plans lest the favorable moment should pass away. Crossing the middle Tigris into Mesopotamia, the bands of Sapor first attacked the important city of Nisibis. Nisibis, at the time a Roman colony, was strongly situated on the outskirts of the mountain range which traverses northern Mesopotamia between the 37th and 38th parallels. The place was well fortified and well defended. It offered a prolonged resistance, but the walls were breached and it was forced to yield itself. The advance was then made along the southern flank of the mountains by Carhai, Haran, and Edessa to the Euphrates, which was probably reached in the neighborhood of Berejik. The hordes then poured into Syria, and, spreading themselves over that fertile region, surprised and took the metropolis of the Roman East, the rich and luxurious city of Antioch. But meantime, the Romans had shown a spirit which had not been expected from them. Gordian, young as he was, had quitted Rome and marched through Moesia and Thrace into Asia, accompanied by a formidable army and by at least one good general. Timesatheus, whose daughter Gordian had recently married, though his life had hitherto been that of a civilian, exhibited on his elevation to the dignity of Praetorian Prefect considerable military ability. The army, nominally commanded by Gordian, really acted under his orders. With it, Timesatheus attacked and beat the bands of Sapor in a number of engagements, recovered Antioch, crossed the Euphrates, retook Carhai, defeated the Persian monarch in a pitched battle near Racina, Reis el in recovered Nisibis, and once more planted the Roman standards on the banks of the Tigris. Sapor hastily evacuated most of his conquests, and retired first across the Euphrates, and then across the more eastern river while the Romans advanced as he retreated, placed garrisons in the various Mesopotamian towns, and even threatened the great city of Tessaphon. Gordian was confident that his general would gain further triumphs, and wrote to the Senate to that effect, but either disease or the arts of a rival cut short the career of the victor, and from the time of his death the Romans ceased to be successful. The legions had, it would seem, invaded southern Mesopotamia when the Praetorian prefect, who had succeeded to Mesotheus, brought them intentionally into difficulties by his mismanagement of the commissariat, and at last retreat was determined on. The young emperor had almost reached his own frontier when the discontent of the army, fomented by the prefect, Philip, came to a head. Gordian was murdered at a place called Zaitha, about twenty miles south of Circesium, and was buried where he fell, the soldiers raising a tumulus in his honor. His successor, Philip, was glad to make peace on any tolerable terms with the Persians. He felt himself insecure upon his throne, and was anxious to obtain the Senate's sanction of his usurpation. He therefore quitted the East in A.D. 244, having concluded a treaty with Sapor by which Armenia seems to have been left to the Persians, while Mesopotamia returned to its old condition of a Roman province. The peace made between Philip and Sapor was followed by an interval of fourteen years, during which scarcely anything is known of the condition of Persia. We may suspect that troubles in the northeast of his empire occupied Sapor during this period, for at the end of it we find Bactria, which was certainly subject to Persia during the earlier years of the monarchy, occupying an independent position, and even assuming an attitude of hostility toward the Persian monarch. Bactria had, from a remote antiquity, claims to preeminence among the Aryan nations. She was more than once inclined to revolt from the Achaemenidae, 
and during the later Parthian period she had enjoyed a sort of semi-independence. It would seem that she now succeeded in detaching herself altogether from her southern neighbor and becoming a distinct and separate power. To strengthen her position, she entered into relations with Rome, which gladly welcomed any adhesions to her cause in this remote region. Sapor's second war with Rome was, like his first, provoked by himself. After concluding his peace with Philip, he had seen the Roman world governed successively by six weak emperors, of whom four had died violent deaths, while at the same time there had been a continued series of attacks upon the northern frontiers of the empire by Alamanni, Goths, and Franks, who had ravaged at will a number of the finest provinces, and threatened the absolute destruction of the great monarchy of the West. It was natural that the chief kingdom of Western Asia should note these events, and should seek to promote its own interests by taking advantage of the circumstances of the time. Sapor, in AD 258, determined on a fresh invasion of the Roman provinces, and once more entering Mesopotamia, carried all before him, became master of Nisibis, Carhai, and Edessa, and, crossing the Euphrates, surprised Antioch, which was wrapped in the enjoyment of theatrical and other representations, and only knew its fate on the exclamation of a couple of actors that the Persians were in possession of the town. The aged emperor Valerian hastened to the protection of his more eastern territories, and at first gained some successes, retaking Antioch and making that city his headquarters during his stay in the east. But after this the tide turned. Valerian entrusted the whole conduct of the war to Macrianus, his praetorian prefect, whose talents he admired and of whose fidelity he did not entertain a suspicion. Macrianus, however, aspired to the empire and intentionally brought Valerian into difficulties in the hope of disgracing or removing him. His tactics were successful. The Roman army in Mesopotamia was betrayed into a situation whence escape was impossible, and where its capitulation was only a question of time. A bold attempt made to force a way through the enemy's lines failed utterly, after which famine and pestilence began to do their work. In vain did the aged emperor send envoys to propose a peace and offer to purchase escape by the payment of an immense sum in gold. Sapor, confident of victory, refused the overture and, waiting patiently till his adversary was at the last gasp, invited him to a conference and then treacherously seized his person. The army surrendered or dispersed. Macrianus, the praetorian prefect, shortly assumed the title of emperor and marched against Gallienus, the son and colleague of Valerian, who had been left to direct affairs in the west. But another rival started up in the east. Sapor conceived the idea of complicating the Roman affairs by himself putting forward a pretender, and an obscure citizen of Antioch, a certain Myriades, or Syriades, a refugee in his camp, was invested with the purple and assumed the title of Caesar. The blow struck at Edessa laid the whole of Roman Asia open to attack, and the Persian monarch was not slow to seize the occasion. His troops crossed the Euphrates in force, and, marching on Antioch, once more captured that unfortunate town, from which the more prudent citizens had withdrawn, but where the bulk of the people, not displeased at the turn of affairs, remained and welcomed the conqueror. Myriades was installed in power, while Sapor himself, at the head of his irresistible squadrons, pressed forward, bursting like a mountain torrent into Cilicia, and thence into Cappadocia. Tarsus, the birthplace of St. Paul, at once a famous seat of learning in a great emporium of commerce, fell. Cilicia Campestris was overrun, and the passes of Taurus, deserted or weakly defended by the Romans, came into Sapor's hand. Penetrating through them and entering the campaign country beyond, his bands soon began the siege of Caesarea Mazaca, the greatest city of these parts, estimated at this time to have contained a population of 400,000 souls. Demosthenes, the governor of Caesarea, defended it bravely and, had force only been used against him, might have prevailed, 
But Zapor found friends within the walls, and by their help made himself master of the place, while its bold defender was obliged to content himself with escaping by cutting his way through the victorious host. All Asia Minor now seemed open to the conqueror, and it is difficult to understand why he did not at any rate attempt a permanent occupation of the territory, which he had so easily overrun, but it seems certain that he entertained no such idea. Devastation and plunder, revenge and gain, not permanent conquest, were his objects, and hence his course was everywhere marked by ruin and carnage, by smoking towns, ravaged fields, and heaps of slain. His cruelties have no doubt been exaggerated, but when we hear that he filled the ravines and valleys of Cappadocia with dead bodies, and so led his cavalry across them, that he depopulated Antioch, killing or carrying off into slavery almost the whole population, that he suffered his prisoners in many cases to perish of hunger, and that he drove them to water once a day like beasts, we may be sure that the guise in which he showed himself to the Romans was that of a merciless scourge, an avenger bent on spreading the terror of his name, not of one who really sought to enlarge the limits of his empire. During the whole course of this plundering expedition, until the retreat began, we hear but of one check that the bands of Sapor received. It had been determined to attack Emesa, one of the most important of the Syrian towns, where the Temple of Venus was known to contain a vast treasure. The invaders approached, scarcely expecting to be resisted, but the high priest of the temple, having collected a large body of peasants, appeared in his sacerdotal robes at the head of a fanatic multitude armed with slings, and succeeded in beating off the assailants. Amisa, its temple and its treasure, escaped the rapacity of the Persians, and an example of resistance was set, which was not perhaps without important consequences. For it seems certain that the return of Sapor across the Euphrates was not effected without considerable loss and difficulty. On his advance into Syria, he had received an embassy from a certain Odenathus, a Syrian or Arab chief, who occupied a position of semi-independence at Palmyra, which through the advantages of its situation had lately become a flourishing commercial town. Odenathus sent a long train of camels laden with gifts, consisting in part of rare and precious merchandise, to the Persian monarch, begging him to accept them and claiming his favorable regard on the ground that he had hitherto refrained from all acts of hostility against the Persians. It appears that Sapor took offense at the tone of the communication, which was not sufficiently humble to please him. Tearing the letter to fragments and trampling it beneath his feet, he exclaimed, who is this Odenathus, and of what country, that he ventures thus to address his lord? Let him now, if he would lighten his punishment, come here and fall prostrate before me with his hands tied behind his back. Should he refuse, let him be well assured that I will destroy himself, his race, and his land. At the same time, he ordered his servants to cast the costly presence of the Palmyrene prince into the Euphrates. This arrogant and offensive behavior naturally turned the willing friend into an enemy. Odenathus, finding himself forced into a hostile position, took arms and watched his opportunity. So long as Sapor continued to advance, he kept aloof. As soon, however, as the retreat commenced, and the Persian army, encumbered with its spoil and captives, proceeded to make its way back slowly and painfully to the Euphrates, Odenathus, who had collected a large force, in part from the Syrian villages, in part from the wild tribes of Arabia, made his appearance in the field. His light and agile horsemen hovered about the Persian host, cut off their stragglers, made prize of much of their spoil, and even captured a portion of the seraglio of the great king. The harassed troops were glad when they had placed the Euphrates between themselves and their pursuer, and congratulated each other on their escape. So much had they suffered, and so little did they feel equal to further conflicts, that on their march through Mesopotamia, they consented to purchase the neutrality of the people of Edessa, by making over to them all the coined money that they had carried off in their Syrian raid. After this, it would seem that the retreat was unmolested, and Sapor succeeded in conveying the greater part of his army, together with his illustrious prisoner, to his own country. 
With regard to the treatment that Valerian received at the hands of his conqueror, it is difficult to form a decided opinion. The writers nearest to the time speak vaguely and moderately, merely telling us that he grew old in his captivity and was kept in the condition of a slave. It is reserved for authors of the next generation to inform us that he was exposed to the constant gaze of the multitude, fettered but clad in the imperial purple, and that Sapor, whenever he mounted on horseback, placed his foot upon his prisoner's neck. Some add that when the unhappy captive died, about the year A.D. 265 or 266, his body was flayed and the skin inflated and hung up to view in one of the most frequented temples of Persia, where it was seen by Roman envoys on their visits to the great king's court. It is impossible to deny that Oriental barbarism may conceivably have gone to these lengths, and it is in favor of the truth of the details that Roman vanity would naturally have been opposed to their invention. But, on the other hand, we have to remember that in the East the person of a king is generally regarded as sacred, and that self-interest restrains the conquering monarch from dishonoring one of his own class. We have also to give due weight to the fact that the earlier authorities are silent with respect to any such atrocities, and that they are first related half a century after the time when they are said to have occurred. Under these circumstances, the skepticism of Gibbon with respect to them is perhaps worthy of commendation. It may be added that Oriental monarchs, when they are cruel, do not show themselves ashamed of their cruelties, but usually relate them openly in their inscriptions or represent them in their bas-reliefs. The remains ascribed on good grounds to Sapor do not, however, contain anything confirmatory of the stories which we are considering. Valerian is represented on them in a humble attitude, but not fettered, and never in the posture of extreme degradation commonly associated with his name. He bends his knee, as no doubt he would be required to do, on being brought into the great king's presence, but otherwise he does not appear to be subjected to any indignity. It seems thus to be on the whole most probable that the Roman emperor was not more severely treated than the generality of captive princes, and that Sapor has been unjustly taxed with abusing the rights of conquest. The hostile feeling of Odonathus against Sapor did not cease with the retreat of the latter across the Euphrates. The Palmyrene prince was bent on taking advantage of the general confusion of the times to carve out for himself a considerable kingdom, of which Palmyra should be the capital. Syria and Palestine, on the one hand, Mesopotamia on the other, were the provinces that lay most conveniently near to him and that he especially coveted. But Mesopotamia had remained in the possession of the Persians as the prize of their victory over Valerian, and could only be obtained by wrestling it from the hands into which it had fallen. Odonathus did not shrink from this contest. It has been, with some reason, conjectured that Sapor must have been at this time occupied with troubles which had broken out on the eastern side of his empire. At any rate, it appears that Odonathus, after a short contest with Macrianus and his son Quietus, turned his arms once more, about A.D. 263, against the Persians, crossed the Euphrates into Mesopotamia, took Carhai and Nisibis, defeated Sapor and some of his sons in a battle, and drove the entire Persian host in confusion to the gates of Ctesiphon. He even returned to lay siege to that city, but it was not long before effectual relief arrived. From all the provinces flocked in contingents for the defense of the western capital. Several engagements were fought, in some of which Odonathus was defeated, and at last he found himself involved in difficulties through his ignorance of the localities, and so thought it best to retire. Apparently his retreat was undisturbed. He succeeded in carrying off his booty and his prisoners, among whom were several satraps, and he retained possession of Mesopotamia, which continued to form a part of the Palmyrene kingdom until the capture of Zenobia by Aurelian, A.D. 273. The successes of Odonathus in A.D. 263 were followed by a period of comparative tranquility. That ambitious prince seems to have been content with ruling from the Tigris to the Mediterranean, and with the title of Augustus, which he received from the Roman emperor Gallienus, 
and king of kings, which he assumed upon his coins. He did not press further upon Sapor, nor did the Roman emperor make any serious attempt to recover his father's person or revenge his defeat upon the Persians. An expedition which he sent out to the east, professedly with this object, in the year A.D. 267, failed utterly, its commander, Heraclianus, being signally defeated by Zenobia, the widow and successor of Odonathus. Odonathus himself was murdered by a kinsman three or four years after his great successes, and though Zenobia ruled his kingdom almost with a man's vigor, the removal of his powerful adversary must have been felt as a relief by the Persian monarch. It is evident, too, that from the time of the accession of Zenobia, the relations between Rome and Palmyra had become unfriendly. The old empire grew jealous of the new kingdom which had sprung up upon its borders, and the effect of this jealousy, while it lasted, was to secure Persia from any attack on the part of either. It appears that Sapor, relieved from any further necessity of defending his empire in arms, employed the remaining years of his life in the construction of great works, and especially in the erection and ornamentation of a new capital. The ruins of Shapur, which still exist near Kazarun, in the province of Fars, commemorate the name and afford some indication of the grandeur of the second Persian monarch. Besides remains of buildings, they comprise a number of bas-reliefs and rock inscriptions, some of which were, beyond a doubt, set up by Sapor I. In one of the most remarkable, the Persian monarch is represented on horseback, wearing the crown usual upon his coins, and holding by the hand a tunicked figure, probably Myriades, whom he is presenting to the captured Romans as their sovereign. Foremost to do him homage is the kneeling figure of a chieftain, probably Valerian, behind whom are arranged in a double line seventeen persons, representing probably the different corps of the Roman army. All these persons are on foot, while in contrast with them are arranged behind Sapor ten guards on horseback, who represent his irresistible cavalry. Another bas-relief at the same place gives us a general view of Sapor on his return to Persia with his illustrious prisoners. Here, fifty-seven guards are ranged behind him, while in front are thirty-three tribute-bearers, having with them an elephant and a chariot. In the center is a group of seven figures, comprising Sapor, who is on horseback in his usual costume, Valerian, who is under the horse's feet, Myriades, who stands by Sapor's side, three principal tribute bearers in front of the main figure, and a victory, which floats in the sky. Another important work, assigned by tradition to Sapor I, is the great dike at Schuster. This is a dam across the river Karun, formed of cut stones, cemented by lime, and fastened together by cramps of iron. It is 20 feet broad and no less than 1,200 feet in length. The whole is a solid mass except in the center, where two small arches have been constructed for the purpose of allowing a part of the stream to flow in its natural bed. The greater portion of the water is directed eastward into a canal cut for it, and the town of Schuster is thus defended on both sides by a water barrier, whereby the position becomes one of great strength. Tradition says that Sapor used his power over Valerian to obtain Roman engineers for this work, and the great dam is still known as the Dam of Caesar to the inhabitants of the neighboring country. Sapor died, having reigned 31 years, from A.D. 240 to A.D. 271. He was undoubtedly one of the most remarkable princes of the Sasanian series. In military talent, indeed, he may not have equaled his father, for though he defeated Valerian, he had to confess himself inferior to Odonathus. But in general governmental ability, he is among the foremost of the Neo-Persian monarchs, and may compare favorably with almost any prince of the series. He baffled Odonathus when he was not able to defeat him by placing himself behind walls, and by bringing into play those advantages which naturally belonged to the position of a monarch attacked in his own country. He maintained, if he did not permanently advance, the power of Persia in the west, 
while in the east it is probable that he considerably extended the bounds of his dominion. To the internal administration of his empire, he united works of usefulness with the construction of memorials which had only a sentimental and aesthetic value. He was a liberal patron of art and is thought not to have confined his patronage to the encouragement of native talent. On the subject of religion, he did not suffer himself to be permanently led away by the enthusiasm of a young and bold free thinker. He decided to maintain the religious system that had descended to him from his ancestors, and turned a deaf ear to persuasions that would have led him to revolutionize the religious opinion of the East without placing it upon a satisfactory footing. The Orientals add to these commendable features of character that he was a man of remarkable beauty, of great personal courage, and of a noble and princely liberality. According to them, he only desired wealth that he might use it for good and great purposes.